Our nation has failed the COVID-19 stress test. The public health outcomes of Taiwan, South Korea, and yes, even China, where the virus originated, might now seem miraculous, but they need to be viewed from the perspective of another Western failure. Decades of not taking government seriously. I'm Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and welcome to the kickoff of Baylor University's 2021 Business Forum. I hope that you will sign up today for all of our upcoming programs, and please don't miss any. And if you do by chance miss one, you can always catch up by going to our YouTube channel at DFW World. Our guest, Adrian Woolridge, and his co-author, John Micklethite, explain in their concise book, The Wake Up Call, why government matters in promoting liberty and democracy. They also lay out a call of action with sensible reforms that might just reverse the trend and rebuild needed trust in our institutions. Before we get started, let me just remind you that you can purchase a copy of the Wake Up Call, Why the Pandemic Has Exposed the Weakness of the West and How to Fix It by going to interabangbooks.com. And yes, you can still get that 10% discount by just going to their, their website and type in DFW World, not just for that book, but for any books that might be in your shopping cart. I'm really pleased that we are able to uh, do this series of programs with Baylor, especially with the Hankamer School of Business. Uh, Steve Gardner uh, is Professor of Economics and Director of the McBride Center for International Business at Baylor. Uh, he's been a good friend. He's been a director of the World Affairs Council. And I'll, I'll say that he's part of our kitchen cabinet and always bringing us good ideas and excellent programs. So Steve, would you do us the honor of saying a few words? Certainly. Well, thank you, Jim. And at Baylor, we've just had a really wonderful relationship with the World Affairs Council for about 30 years. So when it became obvious that we would need to go virtual for the first time, with our annual global business forum. It was clear to me that we should do this in cooperation with the council. And I'm grateful that you, Jim, and your team saw it the same way. So within the council's larger schedule of presentations this spring, you'll find seven that are sponsored by Baylor, featuring prominent scholars, public officials, and journalists who can speak to the opportunities and challenges confronting the global economy during the coming decade. With Baylor's support, these presentations are free and open to the public. You can find the full list and additional information at the World Affairs Council website, dfwworld.org, or by visiting baylor.edu slash global business. So now I'm looking forward to this conversation between Adrian Wooldridge of The Economist, a publication I've been reading for decades, and our good friend, Jim Falk, president of the World Affairs Council. Thank you, Adrian and Jim, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Steve. Adrian, it is great to see you. Uh, Adrian Woolridge is um, he's a, a politics editor at The Economist, political editor, and uh, he was former Washington bureau chief, which means he wrote the Lexington column. Adrian and I got to know each other quite well a few years ago. Uh, I, it was in 2015, Adrian called me. He wanted to do a story about Dallas-Fort Worth and the Metroplex. And uh, it was a great story. You remember that, Adrian? I do indeed, yes. And I, I really encourage people to read it. I, I looked it up again this morning. It's in the July 16th, 2015. Uh, those of you from Dallas-Fort Worth, you'll love the title. It was Boomtown USA. So you can still find it on the website. Adrian, congratulations to both you and John on this book. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing that struck me uh, right away was, uh, did, did the subject, was something that was germinating in your, your minds for a few years and, and, and COVID in a sense was a catalyst? Uh, would you have written this book in, 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 to a degree if, if COVID had not happened? Well, this book was written at very high speed. Um, it was written in a few months, and what's more, it was published in a few months. And it's the publishing rather than the writing, which is most remarkable, because publishers tend to take a year or two years to publish a book. They're, 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 they're quite a, uh, a laborious industry, and um, it was just as difficult to persuade a publisher to get it out very quickly as it was to write it very quickly. Uh, but the reason we were able to do that, I think, is that we've been thinking for a very long time 
about the importance of government. Um, and I think there are two big points that we wanted to make in this book um, and that COVID was the perfect vehicle for making. The one is that government really, really matters. That government can be the difference between life and death, between living and dying. And the second is that the, the West or the democratic world broadly conceived um, has been losing its edge in government, that it's not as far ahead of the rest of the world as it used to be, and in some ways is falling behind uh, uh, significant parts of the rest of the world. And we've been arguing this for some time. I think we both regard ourselves as sort of recovering neoliberals. We were people who were very much shaped, that's John Micklethwaite and myself, very much shaped by, shaped by the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions in the 1980s, uh, and sort of convinced by the idea of shrinking government, taking government off people's backs, handing more and more things over to the private sector through privatization and contracting out and the rest of it. And in recent years, we've begun to question that and begun to think actually government actually matters much more. You, there's more to do with government than just shrink it. You have to make it better. And uh, we, we've been saying that for, you know, for at least five years, probably a little bit more than five years. And COVID really brought that to light. And when we, when we saw that, we said, look, we've got to write a book about this because it's, it's illustrating this massively important theme. And I think, uh, I think a particularly important theme in the United States, because you know, since the Reagan revolution, there's been very many people in, in, in America who've said, let's just shrink government. Uh, it, let's get it off people's backs. And what COVID has illustrated is that we need to go well beyond that style of thinking. So you know, I, I, I failed to say, Adrian, that I want to encourage everyone to uh, feel free to ask questions and we'll get to as yeah. many of them as, as possible. Just yeah. put it into the Q&A box here. You know, you mentioned Ronald Reagan and I pulled up quotes yesterday of Ronald Reagan and smaller government. Yeah. Government does not solve problems, it subsidizes him. And then famously in his inaugural address on, in 1981, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And you can, there's a whole list of, of sure. quotes from Ronald Reagan. You know, Fareed Zakaria famously wrote that book in 2008, uh, The Rise of the Post-American World. And at that point, his thesis was it wasn't so much that the United States is falling behind, it's that the rest of the world is coming up. But you and John really show that that's not the case. And, and briefly, because we don't have you know, lots of time, just sort of talk about this balance between mm -hmm. Asia, particularly China, and the Western world. Well, if you, if you go back to 1600, um, it's the case that Asia is ahead of the rest of the world. It's ahead of Europe. Um, it's got the world's biggest city. It's got the world's most advanced civil service with this extraordinary Mandarin class selected by examinations from the whole of the, the continent. It's got the best Navy in the world. And it's, you know, in many ways, the most civilized society. It's got the biggest encyclopedia. Um, and progressively from 1600 onwards, the West gains ground uh, on China. It does so, you know, partly because of uh, capitalism, the development of capitalism, but it does so also because of the development of government. You get the development of the nation state in the West, you get the development of accountable democratic government or quasi democratic government with the American Revolution and the French Revolution. You get the development of the welfare state in the 20th century. So the West keeps reinventing the state while China just lets it ossify, it doesn't change at all. It's just setting the same examinations, creating the same Mandarin class, not changing. And that you know, reaches its apotheosis in the 1960s when America puts a man on the moon, what tries to abolish poverty, does all sorts of really about, uh, 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 big things with government. Um, and China, well, ha has, has a famine really and, 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 and is continuing to, to have culture, you know, cultural war, cultural revolution and the rest of it. Then from the 1960s onwards, this really begins to change. Asia begins to get its, act together, starting with Singapore, which develops this really efficient, powerful, um, but also slim state, and then spreading after that to uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, and eventually to China. And what China has been doing for the last few years, everybody knows that it's been advancing economically and creating great companies, but it's also been advancing in terms of government. It's got a better education system than it's ever had before. 
It's got a, you know, the beginnings of a welfare state. It's very, very good at building infrastructure. So the government sector in China has been pulling ahead. And I think, you know, this has been happening for some time, but I think COVID really brought this into focus, the extent to which the West has fallen behind and the extent to which China has, has jumped ahead. So now if you look at headline figures, you know, the death rate in the UK um, per million is 1,500 roughly. In America, it's 1,300 per million from COVID. In China, it's three per million. Now, even if we accept that China fiddles its figures and is exaggerating, it, it's not unlikely to be, you know, maybe 10 times that, but it's unlikely to be much more than that. So we've had this global examination of government, of state capacity, and the countries that have really done, not, done badly in that are the United States, Britain, countries that are considered to be at the very center of the Western Alliance, and the countries that have done better uh, are China, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, um, Japan to some extent, countries that are, you know, that, that are traditionally Confucian Asian societies. So there's something going on there that's, that's really quite big, and that's the shift in the center of the balance of power in the world. So I don't think Fareed's right. It's not just that they're catching up with us. It's in some ways, it's in many ways that they're ahead of us. Yeah, I don't think Fareed would say that today. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. I, and we're going to certainly talk a lot more about how the Asian countries approached it. But New Zealand, for instance, has been quite successful, right? And Absolutely. Absolutely. So why? Uh, New Ze yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, New Zealand has now, but they, they've eliminated uh, COVID. I think only the other day they had a, a pop concert with thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and they've done it partly because um, they um, are an island with a relatively small population, but partly because they were very, very fast onto, on, onto this, very fast to close their borders, uh, very fast. Uh, Jacinda Hurd, she's been, she's been extremely good. Uh, during this, they've just been, it's a test, as I say, it's a test of government capacity. And New Zealand is one of the countries that have done really well. It's, it's, it's a very well governed country. One of the reasons I enjoyed reading your book so much is it was, again, sort of a reminder and primer of political philosophy. Yes. And, you know, what, in your view today, should be the role of, of, of government? I heard a US Senator this morning lamenting that our government is not doing one of its key responsibilities, and that is to protect citizens. Absolutely. Well, we start off in this book, uh, we talk in this book about a number of political theorists, but the one we start off with and highlight is Thomas Hobbes, whose book Leviathan, which was published in 1651 in the middle of the English Civil War, is one of the great books that answers, asks and answers the question, what is government for? And his fundamental answer to that uh, problem is that government is to protect people from unnecessary death. He sees the world as being an anarchic place where everybody will try and advance their own interests and end up killing each other or wounding each other, damaging each other in the war to get ahead. So he says that in order to avoid that, we have to give up our rights to this almighty sovereign, which is the Leviathan. And although I think that's a very uh, <laughs> That's a very cynical um, view of the world and a very cynical view of the government. I think he's fundamentally, he does have a basic correct point there. And that is that, you know, the, the, the number one task of the government is to protect you from unnecessary death. And that means both protect the country from external attack, but also um, protect you internally from violence or from a pathogen which is um, transmitted in, in the air. And the idea that a pathogen um, can, can kill you, which is obviously true, really poses a lot of problems for, for the United States and for the idea of individual liberty, which is the, the heart of the United States, because you know, pathogens need a collective solution. We need to come together um, collectively to stop these things and we need to restrict our liberties. We have to wear masks. We have to make sure that we don't go out unnecessarily and mix with other people unnecessarily. Um, and we will quite often have to obey the government's um, instructions to stay at home uh, if the, the virus is particularly serious. So I think that that, that poses great questions for a, a country that is 
founded on liberty. America is obviously founded on liberty. Britain to, 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 to is, is in the same tradition. But I think in certain circumstances, you have to sacrifice your freedoms for the greater good. You know, Scott McIntyre, one of our viewers, in, in, you're touching on this, but perhaps you'll elaborate a bit more. And Scott says, how has neoliberalism encouraged what he calls dangerous individualism? Uh, for example, the West poor job in, in handling COVID. I mean, how do we get people in this country or it's where we're having these problems to accept that there needs to be more of a, for lack of, perhaps the word is collective responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. I think that we, ha we have to accept, first of all, the, 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 the fundamental wisdom of Hobbes, that pre preventing unnecessary death is the most important thing that a government can do. And in certain circumstances, we have to um, hand over some of our freedoms to the government. We did that during the Second World War, when we had, we had conscription, we had all sorts of restrictions on people's liberties, because we are fighting a, a, a collective enemy, which was an evil enemy. And I think we have to do it during, you know, during peacetime when you have a pandemic. And I think we need a more sophisticated notion of freedom than simply the freedom to do whatever we want. You know, as John Stuart Mill, one of the great liberals said, you know, my freedom stops at the end of somebody else's nose. You know, we do have a certain freedom to, to swing our arms about, but not if it hits other people. We have a freedom to, to, to go about our business, but not if it endangers the life of other, uh, of other people. So that's a, that's a very nuanced attempt. But I think what's the worrying thing about neoliberalism in the longer term was it said that, you know, government is bad, markets are good. Uh, and you quoted Ronald Reagan earlier on. Ronald Reagan expressed himself in many, many uh, ways. One of them was through jokes. And he once said, you know, that the 10 most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. If that is 10, I think it is. Um, and, you know, he, there was wisdom in that at the time. In the 1970s, the government was too big. It was doing too many things that it shouldn't be doing, like trying to run businesses um, and trying to hyper-regulate people's lives. But I think we, that created an attitude of government, towards government that it's always wrong and that markets are always right. And I don't think that's, that's, that's at all right. And I doubt if Ronald Reagan would be saying it now. I think it's very unfortunate that the Republican Party, um, in its Trumpian form at least, has, has gone down that, that road saying government, government is a sort of parasite, business is always a wealth creating thing because government is necessary to provide infrastructure, to provide security, to provide defense from enemies, uh, and, to, and to provide the basic sort of, the, you know, the, 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 the context in which business can, can flourish. And I would go, you know, go back to John McCain, who was very, very conscious of, of those things. I think that's the tradition of conservatism that, that I would say is, is, is most sensible here, particularly in the context of particularly in the context of, of, of a pandemic. But I'd say that the biggest thing that sort of this Republican anti-government thing has done is sort of discouraged really good people from going into public service. And it's because, you, you know, back, back in, the, in the 1960s, the best and brightest would, on both sides, the Republican side and the Democratic side, would go into public service. And there was a sort of big consensus from Kennedy to, 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 to the Republicans that we owed our country public service we should do it as, as part of our life and I think that's gone particularly on the the Republican side and that's a great that's a great loss to to the United States because you know the the because the government sector is not only um threadbare it's lacking it's lacking really top class top class talent and 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 that's a good point and it's one of the reforms that that you and John include in your last chapter yeah talk about just because I'm not sure of all of our viewers, and I suspect they'll be surprised to hear what the salaries are for some of the uh, civil servants uh, in, in, in Taiwan or, or, or South Korea. Yeah, I mean, it, well, I mean, the example we quote is Singapore, where it's the, the top civil servants can earn more than a million pounds, a million dollars a year, and quite often significantly more than that, because they're paid sort of performance bonuses according to according to whether they hit their targets or not. So that, that's a lot of money. Um, and they will be paid the same sort of salaries that people are in the private sector. And also the same sort of people will do those jobs. Quite often people will move from the public sector to the private sector. So you might run a big government department and then find yourself 
running Singapore Airlines, which incidentally is one of the world's great airlines. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of notion that you want the same sort of people with the same sort of abilities and quite often the same sort of qualifications to run parts of the public sector and to run parts of the private sector. Uh, Singapore, I think, is the leader there, but there are many other countries that have got a similar approach. Australia um, pays its civil servants very generously uh, and also um, rewards them very generously if they hit performance targets. And of course, the downside of that is that they're, they're sacked as well. If they don't hit those targets, they don't perform very well. They don't keep their jobs. And what we have in the United, what you have in the United States, we have in Britain as well, is a very compressed sort of um, system whereby um, you're not paid, you're paid sort of reasonably well at the bottom uh, compared if you adjust for education and um, uh, benefits, pensions, the rest of it, but you're paid very badly at the top. So there's a cap on the amount you can be paid paid at the top. It's just it's, the idea is you're, it's it's not done. You um, it's uh, you can't be. In, I think in, in America, sorry, in Washington, the great things you can't be paid more than the president. So there's very very little flexibility in what you can get. So if you want to get somebody from the finance sector, you know you they have to take a massive massive pay pay cut. That wouldn't be the case in Singapore. Well, let's bring in someone who does not agree with you, Ken Bain. Your argument, he says, makes no sense. Excellent. These countries are basically dictatorships. And of course, not all of them are dictatorships, I, I, I've had. Um, Ken says freedom costs. So bounce off that, Adrian. <laughs> sure, but does freedom, I mean, one, one, one argument that we try and confront in this book is the idea that the countries that have done well um, in combating COVID are dictatorships and they've done well because they're dictatorships. Now, it's clearly the case that China has done well, I think, at battling COVID and that it has done well because, it is, because it's an extremely authoritarian country. They had a you know, very, very vicious lockdown, which just prevented people. I think they welded, welded many buildings shut and you know, supplied them with food from outside, but, but didn't allow people to go out in, in Wuhan at the worst of the pandemic. But there are many other countries which have done well during the COVID crisis, whilst also being freedom loving democracies. I would say one obvious example of that is um, South Korea, um, which is a very lively country. It has, it's the home of K-pop. It has a very successful cinema uh, industry, as we saw with the Oscar winning film Parasite. It has some of the world's wildest and biggest nightclubs. It has, you know, it has a great nightlife. Um, it's a democracy um, now, and um, it has done very, very much better than the United States or indeed Britain at uh, combating COVID. We talked earlier about um, uh, New Zealand and ob obviously a democracy, no COVID at all. Australia has some COVID, but, but, but very little another democracy. Um, Taiwan, uh, a democracy, which has done extremely well at uh, combating COVID. Uh, and many other autocracies, such as Russia and Belarus, uh, have done very badly with COVID. So I think the, the, the differentia, the, 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 is a false positive to say that in order to, 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 to combat COVID, you need to be an authoritarian regime. It's a false positive because many non-authoritarian regimes have done well at combating COVID. The sad truth is that the correlation is not with freedom or autocracy. The correlation is with efficient, well-organized government. And efficient, well-organized government can flourish in, in, in free countries or can flourish in, in non-free countries. And what really worries me um, is that China is an autocracy, which is also becoming a well-run autocracy. I'm not frightened of badly run autocracies because they're failed, but what about well-run autocracies? They're a real threat to the Western way of life. And that's what China is becoming. I mean, in a sense, China would be a heck of a threat if it became a successful Singapore is what you're saying. That's absolutely what I'm saying. And I think that the, um, the evidence for China becoming a successful Singapore, Singapore's about, I think, 5 million people. China's 1.4 billion. I think. And the evidence is all over the place that China is becoming a successful Singapore. If you look at its school results, it's got, you know, particularly in Shanghai and Beijing, but not only there, you've got extremely good school results based upon having a very competitive 
uh, education system focused on science and mathematics. You've got um, the development of state-owned enterprises. You've got the, the circulation of people from private, the private sector to the public sector. You've got this top-down Mandarin class educated primarily in engineering in China, all of whom are looking to Singapore to, um, to, to model themselves on. A ruthless, autocratic, badly run China is a bad thing, but it's not a real threat to the West. An autocratic, uh, ruthless, well-run China, that's what we ought to be really frightened of. And that's, I think, what we're getting. And that's what COVID suggests we're getting as well. But, you know, Adrian, one of the issues here is we can't even get people to agree to carry a, an identification card. And part of so, it is because we don't trust our government. And absolutely, Ken Rose, he writes this. It's easy to agree that government has an important role in the case of a pandemic. But what is the limiting principle? And he says, um, officials issuing diktats and denying any limiting principle, such oversteps undermine the need of trust. And I think back to the Patriot Act. I mean, right after 9-11, some of the measures that were taken made complete sense, but then it went too far. And I think Absolutely. that's the fear we have here with this. And, and how do you balance that? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's and it's a very, very reasonable fear, because I think when government gets power, almost by its natural order of things, it tends to keep that power. It doesn't want to give it up. Um, and what we talk about in this book, we talk about um, Leviathan as being one model for government. But then we go on to say the next great thinker in the list, you had the revolution in the early in the 17th century, which was the rise of the nation state. Um, acquiring power over uh, local government and local um, power groupings like the aristocracy. But then what you get in the early, uh, in the middle of the 19th century is, a, is the liberal revolution with people like John Stuart Mill, who say government must be limited as far as it can be limited. And above all, it must be accountable to um, people who are watching over it, prime, you know, parliamentarians who are watching over it. And I would say that as soon as as soon as we've been through the the, the Hobbesian phase of of this pandemic, i.e., the state taking power in order to protect people from unnecessary death or suffering, we need to have the the the, the, the liberal phase. We need to have the John Stuart Mill phase. That doesn't mean having no government, but it means having a government that is really watched very very intently. And I think the most important you know, there are many things that the government should be watching, but it should above all be watching the state's capacity to hold information on us. I don't mind giving the government information during in the middle of a pandemic, um, but I'm very worried that if, if the government keeps that information all of the time on my, you know, my every movement. So we need to have powerful committees in Parliament and powerful parliamentarians who can oversee all of these um, government agencies, which have got now vast amounts of information on our on our movements, because of and, big, and, big and that's where then you have this really you know t tough tough decision because in the many of the more authoritarian Asian countries, yes, uh, there's a, a greater acceptance or yes. frankly the inability to say no, you cannot have my cell phone. I will. Not, I'm going to turn it off. Um, yep. So yeah, th that made it easier for these countries to be able to do it. And yet, I, I, I assume you would say there's nothing really in the Asian culture that makes them more amenable to, to, to such. To, to well, I would say there's nothing in the culture. I mean, I think, you know, Singapore is, a, is not a democracy. It's a, it's, it's a quasi democracy, I suppose. It's a, you know, it's a mixture between authoritarian and, and democracy. I think Taiwan, South Korea are democracies. And I think that they do have have some sort of oversight. I've never seen demonstrations as um, vigorous as the demonstrations I've seen in South Korea. This is not a Pacific country. It's a country where people, people are very vocal in expressing uh, you know, their, their claims to rights. But um, I, I think it's very important in, in the democratic countries of, of, of Asia, but also in our democratic countries, that we should um, make governments, and also I should add private private companies such as Google and the rest of them, accountable for the information that they have um, on us. That we shouldn't just let them accumulate vast amounts of uh, 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 amounts of information. So I say, uh, as I say, there are very different rules that apply in peacetime to wartime, and different rules that apply in the middle of a pandemic to 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 to, to, to the rest of time.
So this week's, this week's issue of The Economist focused on the youth in China. Yeah. And one of the ideas that came out of it, one of the conclusions was that Chinese youth can be very supportive of their government, but still be concerned and battle against some of the authoritarian tendencies, but that they have confidence in the government to help uh, pro provide education and, and health care. Yep. I think there's a very strong confidence um, in the youth and pervading Chinese society um, in the government sort of in the notion of this guardian discourse that the government is doing its best for the country. And that's based on the fact that they've had sustained growth for a very long period of time now. And COVID, you know, they're coming out of the, uh, the COVID crisis with higher growth than they went into it. I mean, extraordinary. I mean, they're, they're by far the fastest growing of the big economies in the in the world now, um, but it's a sort of, it's almost a conditional um, confidence that they're, 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 they're willing to give, give their confidence to the government on condition that it keeps growing, it, the economy keeps growing. I think if the economy ever stopped growing, you would have a very, very different attitude very, very quickly amongst, uh, amongst younger people. So Ray Termini, one of our most active listeners and viewers, thank you so much, Ray. It's always good to know that you're with us. Goes to what extent does a government success in fighting the pandemic depend upon voluntary compliance by its people and trust their government and trust in their government? And we're going to throw up a slide that really shows uh, different perceptions, levels of trust in, in various countries. In, in, in here, this is of the United States. Yeah, I mean, I think it it, it, it depends massively on 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 trust, on on willing compliance, which is predicated upon trust. And that trust varies very, very significantly around the world. So you have very high levels of trust in government in Germany, let's say, which has also dealt with the, the pandemic very well, um, and very low levels of trust in government in the United States. And some people would say this is, well, America's a freedom-loving nation. It was born in, in revolution against uh, British government. It's, it's always been suspicious of government. As your chart suggests, I don't think that's true. I think that, 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 that this massive distrust in government is a new thing, you know, relative. If you go back to the 1960s, there was a high degree of trust in government and particularly a high degree of trust in, in sort of elite institutions. And it's been declining, um, well, since, since the, pretty relentlessly since the, since the 1960s. If you go back to the Second World War, America is a society that is characterized by trust in its government and willing to willingness to do what the government tells you during during a wartime now is a now is a peculiar thing it's been going down i think since the 60s with the one exception of the post um, september the 11th when trust in government surged upwards you know on both sides but now particularly in the trump since the trump era you know i think there's there's very little trust in government but there's also very li little trust in objective information as it were that each side has its own set of facts its own information and they don't trust the other side's side's facts so this low trust society that america has become is is very very dangerous and difficult and i i, I would very i think that in order to get um i, I think america needs a revival of its of, of, of an effective government to tackle a number of problems, not only potential repeats of the COVID crisis or other crises of a similar sort, um, but also rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding schools and things like that. Um, but it's a sort of catch-22 situation. You, 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 you're not going to rebuild government unless people trust government. People won't trust government unless it's re re rebuilt. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And one thing's very striking when you look at, at Pew's work yep. is how politicized trust has been. If you're looking you. at when President Trump was in the White House, Republicans yep. had a high level of trust. And when now with Joe Biden, you're yes. seeing the Democrats switch up with, you yep. know, I mean, President Biden has been in office now less than a week and yet already the trust figure is changing. Extraordinary. No, it's, it's extraordinary. And I, I, I would say of the United States that that, that is um, peculiarity. I think we don't have that total politicization of trust in Britain. We have it a bit, but not to, not to the extent that America has done. And again, on, on the continent of Europe. Perhaps you're getting more of it now with your current prime minister. We're getting more. Um, we are getting more, although he, his, um, he's done very well in the COVID crisis. 
Um, he has accepted the verdict of experts. Um, and of course, Britain has done extremely well when it comes to the vaccine and vaccination. We've vaccinated more than 5 million people out of a population of 65 million people. We're number two probably in the world after Israel in terms of, and well, there's, sorry, there's a few very, very small uh, petro states, but uh, the UAE and Bahrain yeah, have done very well. Yeah, they've done very well, but they're, 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 they're tiny. I think I think of the big. We're probably the leading big country um, in the world with this, and that has that has created a, 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 a change of attitude. To, Boris Johnson never had the sort of COVID-related collapse of support in the way that Trump did. Well, talk about this rise of populism because when you look yeah. at Bolsonaro, Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson, and and, and and, and, and former President Trump, those are three that come to mind. All three have had greater challenges uh, on, on COVID than many other countries. Absolutely. Well, you've had this, uh, populism was driven by a revolt against sort of technocratic elites on the grounds that technocratic elites were incompetent and self-serving. Uh, and that was something which was, I think, a long-term reflection of the 2008 financial crisis amongst amongst other things. Um, and we had Brexit in this country, you know, which was a populist revolt against the established order and against the European Union. You had Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, um, sort of a strong man rising in Brazil. Um, and all of those countries have been challenged to uh, a lesser or greater extent by, um, by COVID, because what COVID really does need is a technocratic elite or a medic medical elite to set the agenda and to set about solving the problems. But Trump, I think, doubled down on populism. Um, Bolsonaro has doubled down on populism during the COVID crisis. Trump paid a you know, the cost of losing the election. Bolsonaro has seen his popularity in some ways plunging. But what Boris Johnson did was, because Boris Johnson is a, is, 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 um, a very greasy sort of piglet. He's always changing. Um, and, you know, he suddenly ceased to be a populist and became a technocrat. You know, he appeared day after day after day standing next to the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer. He said that we'll do what the, you know, the, the science recommends. Now, he was a bit slow to do that. And because he was slow, COVID, you know, got off the ground quite quickly in this country. But once he realised that this was not the way to go, um, he, he did change, and as I say, now we are doing relatively well when it comes to distributing, uh, purchasing and distributing the vaccine. Well, let's, let's talk about this di distribution. I just saw yeah. a few minutes ago that New York City has, um, as of this morning, uh, 7,700 doses available, and just over 72,000 people are scheduled for the second dose. Why have we had such a problem with this? And I wonder if I can ask you to comment from this perspective, Operation uh, Warp Speed was incredible in getting the private sector with government support to uh, invent the vaccines. Yep. And that was profit driven, I think yep. to, a, to a degree. Um, and yet the distribution seems to be going really off kilter. Well, both Britain and the United States have led the world when it comes to the development of the vaccine. We have the Ox Oxford va vaccine, you have various other vaccines. Um, and if you look at um, you know, the rest of the world, if you look at China, uh, Russia, and the rest of it, they, they either haven't developed vaccines as, as, uh, as rapidly, or they're not, any, they're not, Sputnik is not anywhere near as good as, as, as the vaccines we've developed. Uh, but you have been very bad at distribution so far. Um, we had, you had the end of the Trump presidency, the election, a lot of confusion, um, a very sprawling, incoherent system that needs serious direction from the top in order to get it going. Um, we in Britain have done much better. As I said, we've now distributed about, I would say, five million uh, dosage and the pace of distribution is going up. So, and we've, we've done it very, very strictly according to, 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 to age and vulnerability. And so we've now done, I think, everybody over 80, now it's well into the, the population of people over 70. Um, and we did that because we bought the vaccine early, we bought large amounts of the vaccine early, and because we have this National Health Service, which is whatever its, 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 its defects, is very good at pandemics and at distribution. 
the national system for distributing uh, medicine, essentially. Um, but we've we we've particularly done better than the, than, than the European Union. The European Union has been very slow to to was very slow to purchase um, the vaccine and has been very slow to distribute it. And you know, countries such as France have almost distributed nothing. So I would say that America is not a world leader in this, but it's doing better than France, it's doing better than of Europe. You know, we're having an issue in our country about certain segments of our population, primarily uh, African-Americans, Blacks, sure. reticent. Uh, what is the percentage of acceptance in, in the UK? Of, of We have exactly the same. We have exactly the same problem. Um, that the, there are certain groups of people um, who are very resistant to this. And we haven't really hit the problem in as big a way as we're going to, because we're dealing with people in their, in their, in their 80s. What group uh, specifically? The immigrant population is, is younger. What, what groups specifically? Uh, Afro-Caribbean, um, immigrants, Muslims, um, we mostly come from Pakistan in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who are very suspicious of um, the state, very suspicious of injections. Um, and in the, in the Pakistani population, a lot of them are first generation immigrants who, you know, who, who haven't been for, here for very long. So they will be suspicious of many of them don't speak, speak English. So, but we haven't come across that because we're not dealing with, the, with, with, with those groups, but that will become a bigger pop problem. And immigrant populations are very concentrated in um, care institutions that look after old people. Um, and very concentrated in the National Health Service. So we, we, th this will be a problem. There are people who just, I think I've seen figures of 50% of people who work in care homes saying that they won't get, get vaccinated. Um, and that's a, the, an issue of communication and persuasion of a, of a very high order, I think. Yeah, in this country, it's been in some of the large health care facilities, 30 to 40%. Right, right. We're seeing exa ex exactly the same patterns. Very, very interesting. This is a, a, a full paragraph, but let me let me read it. Um, yeah. My 90 year old grandmother once told this is from one of our viewers. My 90 year old grandmother once told me that she hoped that we did not go through what she did in her generation, World War II. I asked why she commented, because you won't make it. You could not pull together with the trust necessary to follow your leadership in the battle like we did. There are times you must learn to conform and get moving, not tweet or text. We did not have time to question. We would not all be here. We had to move fast and we did, hence your sleeping giant. Thank you for sending that to us. Uh, there's a lot of truth in that. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think that we have, I, I hesitate to use the word decadence, but there is a sort of sense in which America, Britain, we've been on top for a long period of time. We've been used to living a fairly comfortable life and we've been used to having 120 television channels to choose between. Um, and it's it's hard to suddenly say, actually, you can't have choice. You have to do what the government government says. It goes against the cultural grain. Um, but um, you know, circumstances change. A pandemic is, is 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 a very very different thing from 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 what it used to be. And I think we have to. And I'm saying this. I mean, the vast majority of people in Britain, anyway, have been willing to obey the government, stay at home, wear masks, do the right thing. But certainly, a very vocal group of people um, haven't. Mm -hmm. Germany, a very vocal group of Germans, as I say. And then there's conspiracy theories. I've seen figures of about twenty percent of people in some European countries saying that it's a government hoax and they shouldn't shouldn't obey it. Um, so there are many many weird beliefs circulating around. So one of the reforms, again, that's in in the book is about the. the recommendation to embrace digital and, and be yeah. more efficient. David Sanders writes this, businesses are embracing the digital revolution. If government is going to take more of a role in our lives, then it needs to embrace the digital technologies. How well do you see government doing that? And I think, you know, you could also touch on this, Adrian, about the, the need for the go government to work more efficiently, effectively with the private sector. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think digital is absolutely vital. And one of the problems with uh, particularly American government on the digital front is it's a collection of outmoded systems. You have, I think, about 40 percent of systems in the, the health uh, public health system um, are not supported. They're outdated in the sense that they're not supported by 
you know, current technology, they're, 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 they're obsolete systems, but they're sort of kept going um, despite not having um, any, any support. Uh, and I think there are five times as many people in the public sector, in the IT departments in the public sector, over 60 than under 30. So you have an aging workforce and an aging technology. Um, and in a world where the technology is being reinvented every, every five minutes, um, that's a very, very dangerous formula. And I think what you actually have to do is have a one-off, not one-off upgrade, but you, you sometimes have to say, let's, we have to sacrifice these old systems. We have to stop just patching them together and move to a new system. And we also have to do something about recruiting bright young people with an IT background, because those people sort of automatically now going into the private sector because the rewards are so huge compared to the public sector. And I think what we have to do is start recruiting uh, more people with technology backgrounds. And one of the things we argue in this book um, is it might be time now to renew to national service, mm -hmm. obligatory service to, 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 to the government. We, we're not arguing for necessarily a military national service, but we're arguing that people should have to work for the government for a year or perhaps two years um, as part of their duty as citizens. And one of the reasons for doing that is to get people of a tech savvy generation into government departments, people who would naturally just go straight into the private sector. So, so that the government departments can get access to the brains and skills and knowledge of younger people who are au fait with this technological revolution that's going on. And I, I, I say that because um, I think it's important to plug that technological gap, but also I think there's a social gap that needs to be uh, filled, that, that, that for large numbers of young Americans, the public sector is something that they don't really interact with anymore. It's something that's not part of their lives. Um, and they don't quite often, I think, large numbers of people don't interact with poorer people. You know, America's becoming such a segregated society now that, that, that if you're if you're affluent and successful, the only poor people you're gonna come across is the people who deliver your Amazon parcel um, every, every, every now and again. And I think you know, a, a period of public service um, might actually help to bind the country together and put people through a certain sort of common experience, which happened during the Second World War, happened in the 1950s with national service. I have to tell you, Adrian, we hear this yeah. from so many people, policymakers and others who yeah. come and speak at the World Affairs Council. And I've been hearing this for over a decade, and yet there's been really no move, movement towards yes. it. Yes, so I know. Why should, we have just a few more minutes. Tell me yes, why sorry. I should vote for Bill Lincoln. Oh, Bill Lincoln, well, we, we, we thought that um, what we wanted to do was to create, uh, to, to make a suggestion about what should a public servant, what should a president be doing? And so we invented a sort of ideal president um, who is a composite of William Gladstone, the great 19th century English reforming liberal prime minister and, uh, and, and Abraham Lincoln, the great, you know, one, of your, one of your greatest presidents, if not the greatest president. And we called him Bill Lincoln. Um, he's a composite of the two and he makes him a reformer who believes that you have to have good government. And we said to this imaginary Frankenstein monster figure, please reform American government and the only constraint we put to you is that you must use ideas that are already being used somewhere in the world to make for better government. And then we went through looking at the sort of things that this imaginary figure would be doing. And we, we constructed a long, and I won't go through the entire list, but it, including, it included things like try national service, try making the system more resilient, try a widespread reform of the healthcare, system, try reforming your taxation system so that it's less unbelievably complicated than it is at the moment, and try modernizing uh, your governments. And one of the things that we found extraordinary was that the number of ideas that, that in, in terms of global best practice happen now to be found in um, Asia, Southeast Asia in particular. If you say, you know, if you look at three quarters of the world's smart cities, which are cities that make maximum use of the internet of things, of high technology, of you know, smart meters, all of the sort of things that, 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 that will make um, the, the government of the city um, up to date and internet um, enabled. 
the three quarters of those cities are now in um, in in the Far East. Singapore, um, you know, you, Singapore, South Korea are using um, the Internet of Things in particular to 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 regulate the flow of traffic, to change traffic lights, to regulate the flow of um, you know um, underground cars, just to uh, well. Check if is working and the rest of it. Just when you see the list of the world's best universities, I mean, that list yeah. is including a lot more universities from Asia than every year there's one or two new Every ones. year there's another one, absolutely. But I do want to bring in, I, I, I think Tim Bellman has an interesting question for you. You know, many of the improvements that you're talking about, I think he believes make sense. Um, but how do you change the short termism of the politicians to make the changes? Very, very difficult. But sometimes, you know, we have to point out in many ways that short termism is 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 quite often self defeating. If you look at the way that America's um, roads are deteriorating, its bridges are deteriorating, um, and its airports now some of the worst in the world uh, of, of the rich world. You know, if you you fly to China from Kennedy Airport and you're flying from a backwards country to an advanced country. I mean, I say China. I mean Shanghai or Beijing. Um, and I, I think that's because the, the country is spending more and more mo uh, of its spare money on keeping its pension system unreformed, retirement, getting people retiring relatively early by global standards and giving them very good pensions by global standards and not putting that money into infrastructure development. But eventually the bridges fall down and the, and the highways become you know, unroadworthy. Um, I would also say that it's not just a matter of short term versus long term. It's a matter of faith in government uh, and the way that you, uh, what I really would want to do is persuade Democrats that government is so important that you have sometimes to take on the you know, public sector unions, teaching unions, powerful unions who may be blocking reform. And I want to persuade the Republicans that government is, 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 is so important that you can't just belittle it and say it doesn't matter. So I, you know, the, the Republican Party needs to recognize government matters. The Democratic Party needs to recognize that government needs to be reformed. So, so the Economist, of course, is famous for not showing bylines except yeah. the world in and in mm -hmm. uh, the 1843 magazine, which is always great fun. And you often have a, a column there. And yeah. I, I, I saw one and re was reminded that you wrote this column last January before COVID became a truly a, a, a global issue about headphones. And you know, we walk on college campuses and we see everybody in their own isolated environment. So in a sense, our isolation now, our lockdown has exacerbated this, hasn't it? Absolutely, we, 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 we became sort of these rather insular people in their own sound worlds, listening to, to, to their own sound worlds. And then suddenly they couldn't even walk around their campus. They had to sit, sit at home and I wonder when we go back into the outside world, whether we'll still be wearing all of those headphones to, to, to insulate ourselves, or perhaps we'll actually be listening to the world and talking talking to each other. But it is extraordinary the way everybody lived in their own own little universe. Perhaps perhaps we'll become a little bit more sociable when we don't we don't have lockdown anymore. I think we'll be starved for conversation like that. Yes, absolutely. On Zoom, and I want you to come back to yeah. to, to to Dallas. So because I. I'm friends with you and many other people, journalists and editors of The Economist. I, I kept thinking Wednesday nights must not be much fun because you, you put the magazine or as you would say, the newspaper to bed on Wednesday. And for some reason, all the key major events in the United States have happened on the last few Wednesdays. What was it like on, on January 6th? How well, normally we love when we love the United States because at least you have elections on a Tuesday. In Britain, we have elections on a Thursday which is after we've gone to press. So we have to create a second edition um, because being a British based organization, we can't just ignore the, 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 the election. So we actually produce a second edition uh, to come after the election. But your elections tend to take longer and longer now and they get closer and closer. So it's, it's, it's hard to know what the exact result is even by, by Wednesday. And then you have, um, we had you know January the 6th, which was an extraordinary event, but I think we covered it really quite well, but very, very late. Um, and a lot of sudden changing of changing of, 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 of covers, but you're not a, you're not alone in in, in, in that. It does it well. If you're a newspaper that goes to bed on Wednesday, you do tend to notice a lot of things seem to take place on Wednesday. I remember a lot of the Arab Spring Wednesday seemed to loom, loom quite large. So, what is your sense 
we have the, um, just another minute. What yeah. is your sense of how the United States is going to learn from January 6? What was its impact? Will we be talking about it? Will, will historians be talking about this as a monumental event 50, 100 years from now? Well, the extraordinary thing about January the 6th is if you look at the American Constitution, and if you look at what Madison in particular is saying, is he's saying the great terrible thing about democracies is they become mobocracies and the mob takes over. And the whole of the, uh, you know, the founding document was to prevent the rule of mobs. And you almost got the rule of mobs. So I think it'll be seared onto the American con con conscience because, you know, they're, 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 it was so clear to the founders that, you know, they're so intricate in their design of a system that was supposed to be to free democracy from the rule of, rule of mobs. And I wonder now whether it's going to be a, an isolated event or whether the partisanship and the anger that's now built up into the system will, will lead, to, lead to more examples of this. I mean, I was devastated and stunned when it, when, when it happened. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, in Britain, we had crowds of protesters outside Parliament for a couple of years after, after Brexit, you know, very, very angry people. They didn't break in. But um, they would have done had there not been a big police presence and, and, and a lot of iron railings keeping them out. So, you know, the world is becoming an angry, the democracies are becoming angry and angrier places. And, you know, you look at Paris, uh, many, many protests of very angry people in the street. They haven't stormed the Elysee, but they burnt cars and, and, and knocked down buildings and uh, all sorts of violent things. So cool. America alone. Well, Adrian, as always, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. I want to congratulate you and John for writing the book. Uh, it's not a long book. It's only about 100, I think, 140 pages or so. Right, yes. Uh, Short books are uh, hard to write. Good read, well written, as you might expect from The Economist. Only had to look Thank up you. a few words. But uh, Adrian, thanks so much for being with us. And, and special thanks as well to, to Baylor and all of the Baylor members of the Baylor community who join us today. Thanks so much for being with us and I know we'll see you again very soon. Oh,